The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Nobody here tonight made it on our own. We all owe somebody. We owe some debts. And how's the best way to pay back those debts? Obviously, the prime way is to become a peacemaker. And what is peace? Lots of definitions for it. The most basic, of course, is that peace is the result of love. And if love was easy, we'd all be good at it. As a writer, I've been very fortunate to interview many of the world's great peacemakers when they passed through Washington. I've interviewed Desmond Tutu from South Africa. I covered Martin Luther King when I was a reporter starting out. I've interviewed Mother Teresa from Calcutta, Mayred Corrigan from Belfast, who's been here as, a, as one of the honorees, Perez Esquivel from Buenos Aires, Rigoberto Menchu from Guatemala, Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh, all Nobel Peace Prize winners. And I'd always ask them toward the end of the interview, how do you go about decreasing violence and increasing peace? Almost always the answer came back, you need to go where people are. That's all we have, people with conflicts. And solving them, and solving them either with fists, guns, armies, bombs, and nuclear weapons, or solving them nonviolently. The only two ways. And they said, you got to go where people are. So I took their advice in the early 1980s and went to a local high school near my office at the Washington Post. And I asked the principal, can I come in and teach a course on nonviolence? She said, give it a try. See what happens. One little problem, we have no money here at this school. We're a very poor school. We can't afford to pay you. I said, I didn't come for money. I came to volunteer. So I began teaching the course. In fact, those books, if you'd pass those books around, uh, uh, are the ones we've been using. It's not a very difficult course to teach. And you read the literature piece. And you read some Gandhi, King, Thomas Merton, Dorothy Day, A.J. Musty, Sojourner Truth, Anne Ballou, Joyce Fox, John Woolman on the first day. <laughs> and then we really get into it. And after I rattle off those names, someone always jumps up and says, how did you ever hear of all those people? How come we haven't heard of them? You haven't heard them for an obvious reason. You've been going to conventional schools where we teach you everything but. How do I know that? Well, let me ask you two questions. How many of you went to a high school where they taught you courses either in conflict resolution or peace studies? Hands? No hands go up. If this was a peace-loving, peace-seeking, peace-building, and peace-affirming society, every hand would have gone up. Second question. How many of you went to a high school where they required you to take algebra and geometry? <laughs> all hands go up. So there's a good chance we all graduate from high school as peace illiterates. But they made sure we graduate from high school knowing all about pi r squared times bonkazoids, crankazoids, dorkazoids, lunazoids, hemorrhoids, steroids, and apoids for the deep thinkers. Who cares? Have you ever seen a hell wanted ad for an algebraist? I haven't. Now, if you like algebra and geometry, that's fine. I think it's kind of odd anybody would, but we need a few odd people around for diversity. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you went on a date with your husband, wife, sweetheart, or partner and leaned over during dinner time and said, oh, darling, what a moment this is. Let's talk about algebra. 
Now, have you ever done that? If you did, we're going to get some therapy for you. I, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so we don't teach the children peace, and unless we do teach them peace, somebody else will teach them violence. So I began teaching the courses, and it turns out that it's very difficult to crack some of our schools, because uh, you know what's going on now with the testing mania. Leave no child untested. Everybody get that one? No? All right. They, uh, and uh, children always ask, well, it's a great idea, but where has it ever worked? Well, it has worked. In just the past 20 years, there have been at least seven brutal governments overthrown by people who had no tanks, no bombs, no bullets, and no guns. The first country to go down was the Philippines. Remember 1986, Ferdinand Marcos, one of our great clients for weapons, called Great Humanitarian by Jimmy Carter, if you remember. He was brought down by some Catholic nuns who studied under Gene Sharp at Harvard, the great theoretician on nonviolence. Two years later, Pinochet was driven from power in Chile. They, uh, they waged a three-year strike to get a fair election. Lech Walesa, shipyard worker in Poland, never went to college, but he studied Gandhi, and he knew that power will never yield voluntarily, as Saul Alinsky often said. He drove the Soviets out of Poland. And when he took power from General Jaruzelski, the Polish puppet, uh, the Soviet puppet, he quoted Gandhi when the British left India. Uh, Gandhi told the British, and Lech Walesa told the Soviets, we never wanted to bring you to your knees we just want to bring you to your senses on the great lines. Nelson Mandela was driven, became the president of that country after spending 27 years in the Robben Island prison. He invited to the inauguration in 1995 the warden of the prison. And during the ceremony, he looked over at him and said, Warden, you locked me up for 27 years in a cell. I want to tell you something. I forgive you. One of the great moments. Milosevic was driven from power, not by Bill Clinton bombing Serbian people, but by students who organized a two-year strike, and they brought Milosevic down. He was not dragged through the streets, but he was removed from power. Czechoslovakia, Vaclav Havel, he was in prison for four years. He became president. The people organized. Republic of Georgia, Shevardnadze, Revolution of the Roses. If someone came here 20 years ago and said, you know, I think that in the next two decades there's going to be seven brutal governments overthrown by people who have no bullets, no bombs, and no tanks, and no armies, you'd have said, friend, you are clearly dreaming. That will never happen. But it did happen. But unless we teach our children about that, they don't know that there are alternatives to violence. It's not just military violence. I had a student not long ago. We spent about, about two or three weeks reading essays by Gandhi and discussing his ideas and his life. And a, a student walked out of class, and right before she left the door, she turned to me and said, this has all been very nice learning about Gandhi's theories, but I go home to a war zone. My parents are waging war for the past five or 10 years. They verbally abuse each other. They emotionally abuse each other and often physically. How do I stop that war? Good question. Maybe if we'd had her mother and father when they were in school and taught them something about the basics of conflict resolution or mediation skills, that might not have happened. Because it's easier to build a peaceful child than to repair a violent adult. That's why peace education is crucial. It's very difficult to crack the schools. I was giving 
a talk to a school board recently in a, a school district back east near Washington. It, it, I spoke to the county school board. It's a very liberal county. And I spoke to the school board and told them, you have 22 high schools in, uh, here in your county. I think we ought to have peace studies programs in, in, in each of those high schools. So I spoke to them for about half an hour. And at the end, the school board, one of the school board members said, well, we certainly appreciate you coming in to present your views and we'll certainly ponder these issues. School boards love to ponder. That's where the word ponderous comes from. <laughs> and the school board person said, you know, you kept using that phrase, peace studies. It, 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 it's going to cause trouble out here. The word, I said, what's going to be the problem, I said. Oh, the word studies is okay. We got no problem with that. But that other word, peace, that, 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 uh, could you come up with another phrase? And, and I, I envisioned the headline the next day in the newspaper, Peace Studies Proposal Alarms County School Board <laughs> with the subhead, Disturbing Idea, must be snuffed out immediately. So that's what we're up against. And so our school teachers right now are, are very demoralized because of the testing mania. I spoke over today at the Kate School, which I'm sure some of you know, very fine prep school. I did a student assembly. And I was, I was very touched by, the, by many teachers come up and say, we want to teach a peace course here. How do we go about it? Well, I said, get some books and read some literature and, get, and start discussing it. I did a little $100 bill quiz. Whenever I talk to prep schools or colleges, I always do a little $100 bill quiz. I hold up $100, and I ask the students to identify a few people. And I call out the names. I call, the first name I called out today was Robert E. Lee. Every hand shot up. Oh, great Civil War general. We know all about him. Then I said, who was Ulysses S. Grant? A lot of hands go up, oh, yes, oh, you know, the great general. And then said, who's Paul Revere? Oh, oh, Lexington and Concord, the great battle, Revolutionary War. So everybody's three for three. They're all counting their money all of a sudden. <laughs> Got three to go. Then I said, who is Emily Balch? <laughs> no hands on that one. I said, if this was a peace-loving, a peace-seeking, and peace-affirming society, every hand would have gone up on Emily Balsh's name. She was a professor at Wellesley College, 1950s. Started to make a little trouble at Wellesley. She thought the women there ought to be taught how to be peacemakers, not just homemakers. Well, that idea was kind of radical for Wellesley then. So they eased her on out. She went down to Philadelphia and went on to found the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and won the Nobel Peace Prize, an American woman. And nobody knew about her. You can spend a whole, a whole year studying her life and times and her writing. Next name I called out was Jeanette Rankin. Nobody knew that one except one girl in the back who happened to be from Montana which helped a little bit, because that's where Jeanette Rankin was from. She was the first member of Congress who was a woman. Montana sent her four years before we had the federal vote for the 19th Amendment. She was a pacifist, a feminist, and a Republican. Yes, it does happen sometimes. <laughs> uh, and came to Washington, and one of the first votes was on whether the U.S. should enter the First World War. Her brother was working for her. I said, you know, Jeanette, Woodrow Wilson said, this is the war to end all wars. You better go down and vote with the boys. She was one of about 35 House members of Votes No and gives that great speech, which ended up with the wonderful lines, you can no more win a war than win an earthquake. One of the great lines in U.S. history. She was defeated, of course as she knew she would be. You can't oppose war and be reelected in this, in this country. Went back to become a school teacher, a little country schoolhouse in Athens, Georgia, 
And the kiddies didn't know who she was. They didn't know she's a great peacemaker. 1941, Rose around. She goes back to Missoula to visit the family. Her brother's at the train station greeting her and says, you know, Jeanette, there's an open seat for Congress. Why don't you run for it? Everybody forgot what you did when you were a wild kid and back in your immature 20s. You've grown up, haven't you? She said, sure, I have. Runs, wins. As she comes back, the first vote is on December 8th, 1941. <laughs> and while they're doing that day, they're voting on the Second World War. And she, as she turns to her brother and says, I didn't miss a thing. The boys are still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> She's the only one this time votes no. One of our great American peacemakers. And the kids don't know except that one girl out of 300 students. I then asked the last name. I thought it goes somebody from California. Barbara Lee. Nobody knew Barbara Lee. The only one this time that votes no against on. And that vote, as you may remember, took, took place on 9-14, three days after 9-11. The only one in Congress that voted no to go into war with Afghanistan. So why do they know all about the men who break the peace but not the women who make the peace. Schools haven't taught them. It's not their fault. And often the teachers don't even know. So we have a little work to do. And I was very touched by the Kate School, which will be starting a peace studies course this, this fall. And the teachers are eager to do it. I tell the students, you ought to organize and make this happen. You're the customers. I don't think anybody ought to graduate from high school without organizing at least one student strike. <laughs> you learn a little bit about power that way. I have a little rule in my classes. I tell the students the first day they come in, you're not, you're not allowed to ask any questions in this class. Don't you dare ask a question. I tell them, do something much braver, much bolder, and much more courageous. Question the answers. What answers? The ones anybody gives you that says the answer is violence because they're clearly lying to us. But we keep hearing, oh, this time it's going to work. Let's stay the course. We heard that during the Vietnam War. We hear it right now. There are about 15 similarities between Iraq and Vietnam. Both began with a deception. Both were cheered on by the media. Uh, most in Congress supported it. We knew nothing of the culture in Vietnam. We knew nothing of the Iraqi culture. Ancient, ancient countries, rich literature. We didn't even speak the language when we went to Iraq or to Vietnam. High civilian casualty rate. I take my classes to the wall in, v in, in, in DC, the Vietnam Wall. And I'm always, I always tell the students, this wall is not complete. Where are the Vietnamese names on this wall? If we had a wall for them, included them, that would stretch from the Lincoln Memorial to the U.S. Capitol. There are about 2.3 2 million Vietnamese who lost their lives in that war. They, are not their lives also sacred? So I tell the class, question the answers. And it's not just about military violence. As we said, that girl before who said, my parents are fighting each other. The leading cause of injury among American women is being beaten up at home by husband, boyfriend, ex-husband, ex-boyfriend. Go into any ER room in this country and ask the doctors and nurses, what are women coming in for? And they will tell you. A large number are coming in because they've been beaten up by someone they know, not some anonymous mugger coming out from the alleys. I come to you from Washington, D.C. Does anybody know what D.C. stands for? Yeah, that's what they tell you. A few of us think it stands for death capital. That's a little harsh, but accurate. What's it mean? Well, that's where the Congress is. And what does Congress do? Well, you may think it's, it's about politics, it's about campaigns and who's ahead in the polls and who has this position. Might be. Politics is really about 
one thing only. Who decides where the money goes? That's what politics is. The current military budget, according to the Center for Defense Information, is $878 billion. Now that number is too large unless you are either a math major or an astronomer. <laughs> it's way out in the ozone, you can't grasp it. It comes down to $2.5 billion a day. That's still kind of high for all us thousand heirs, or dollar heirs if you're a student. <laughs> It comes down to $28,000 a second. $28,000, $28,000, $28,000. I can't stop. Will someone please stop me? $28,000. I can't stop. $28,000. I can't stop. Someone please stop me. $28,000. I'm addicted like the Pentagon. They can't stop either. That's where the money's going. Half of our federal taxes goes to the Pentagon, given to them by, by Congress. And keep in mind, I blame nobody in the military for our problems. I blame nobody in Congress for the, for the wars we're in. Who do I blame? Well, of course, I blame myself. I have to figure out how to be a better father, a better husband, a better writer, a better teacher. And each of us has to ask, Am I using my gifts well uh, 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 to be peacemakers? Uh, because before we disrupt the system with our commitment to nonviolence, we need to disrupt our own lives and begin to figure out where are we spending our money and where are we spending our time? I always tell the high school students that wonderful line, live simply so others may simply live. And they ask, well, how do you do that? Well, you figure out the difference between what you need and what you want. There's a big difference because we raise our kids uh, to want things. That's what the commercials are all about, the advertising, are the companies going after the kids. I always, I always tell my college students, write a paper this semester, not another dull research paper with footnotes and side notes. Write a, research your own life and figure out how do you deal with violence? Do you inflict it? And if you do so, why do you do that? And also tell about other times you have been, been wounded by somebody. And they write great papers about it. I also tell them, if you really want to be courageous this semester, don't drink alcohol. Because I asked them, how many of you are environmentalists? On all hands go up. I said, what about your own, your own body as the most basic environment of all? What are you doing about that? I tell them, don't give your money to the alcohol industry. Don't give it to them. It's the worst of all the drugs. There's nobody here tonight who can't, who, if you look back far enough, you'll, you'll find a relative whose life was ruined by abuse of the alcohol drug. And I tell them also, while you do that, don't eat meat this semester. Because that's the biggest war of all going on in this country. It's the war on animals. We kill every day in this country 12 million animals for food. We eat them. We ride them, we hunt them, we dissect them, we imprison them in our zoos, we laugh at them at the circus. Animals may not think as we do, but they feel pain as we do. Alice Walker, the great California writer from Northern California, once said, the animals of the world exist for their own reasons. They were not made for humans any more than Blacks were made for whites, or women were made for men. That sums it up in a very couple of pure sentences. I teach also Martin Luther King in my classes. I teach the, I teach the real King, not the safe, sanitized King. As you know, King was assassinated on a Thursday afternoon in Memphis, Tennessee. Does anybody know where he gave his last 
and final Sunday sermon. Church. You're warm. He gave it in, at the National Cathedral. Uh, the Riverside Church speech was April 4th, 1967, a year to the day before he would die. But it was a very similar speech. You're right. And in that speech, is that large textbook going around called Solution to Violence? Uh, right there. Would you turn uh, to page 69 for me? There's an essay in there. I think this was hide the Vietnam War. Uh, this is from the speech you just mentioned. It's Riverside Church. On the upper right-hand corner, far upper right, it begins, I knew that I could never again. Would you just stand up and read that in a nice, slow, clear voice for us? Listen, this is King talking about the United States government. My own government. That's the real king. But we rarely talk about it. The media never bring that king up. They're building a memorial right now, right near the Lincoln Memorial, back in Washington. And there'd be a nice, that'd be a nice statue of king. Would anybody like to make a little wager that that lines, that those lines will not be carved in marble or stone? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take all bets, give you any odds you want. It won't be happening. Nor will another line on the next page, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on programs of military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. That too is the real king. But we've got to teach that in our schools also. Otherwise, we sanitize king. We make him safe so it doesn't disturb our peace. One of the things I also stress in peace education is experiential learning. That's the trouble with us professors and teachers. We're so busy packing ideas into our students' minds that they often leave us idea rich, but experience poor. What's the remedy? Get them outside the classroom as much as possible. I announced the first day of every semester, we're gonna get outside the classroom this year. We're gonna go work in a rape crisis center Battle women shelters, soup kitchen, jail, prison, migrant worker camp, Special Olympics. Let's teach somebody how to read this semester. This country has about 40 million people who are illiterate. That's a pretty big number. That's about the same number of people in the last election that voted for George W. Bush. <laughs> and might have been the same group, too. Now, now that was a cheap shot. Uh, but it felt good, didn't it? All right. I get all these lefties riled up, David. <laughs> Listen, uh, every once in a while, one of those kind of slips out, okay? I'm in, I'm in, I'm in impulse control therapy to get over it. <laughs> Correction on that one, okay? It wasn't the illiterate folks who voted for Bush. It was all those educated people in Palm Beach and Palm Springs. Illiterates knew better. I took the class the other day to a women's shelter. It's run by some Carmelite Catholic nuns, right about a mile from the U.S. Capitol. And the next time you come to Washington, I try to find the real city. Because there's two cities there. A city of big buildings, big egos, big talkers. And then you have a city of poor people. We have 22 high schools in Washington. We have the highest dropout rate of any city in America. I teach at three public high schools. One's a very wealthy school in Chevy Chase, Maryland. We have six tennis courts in the campus. I hope we can get by with only six this year. The other two are very poor school. One is a large a public high school. It's chaotic. How chaotic? Well, we have six police in the halls, armed with high-powered weapons and wearing bulletproof vests. You gotta walk through a metal detector. It's even tougher than the airlines walking through the airports. The other school is probably the poorest school in America, the one where I began to volunteer in the early 1980s. 
How poor is it? It has no cafeteria, no gym, no auditorium, no lockers, no athletic fields, and for the past two years, no clean drinking water. And it's the closest school to the White House, only five blocks away from power. We keep inviting presidents to come talk to our students. They don't seem able to make it. They can't make it five blocks. Oh, Bush will go out, Clinton, they'll go all around the country talking about school reform. Can't make it five blocks. We don't mind. We're not into big shots at that school. We're into long shots. Because that's what they know they are. They've got to work twice as hard to make it. In between the White House and the Capitol is the homeless belt of America. There are about seven or eight homeless shelters. I took my jaw... Uh, you have Caesar on one end of town and Pharaoh's on the other, and in between the forgotten poor. I took my Georgetown Law School class the other day to a women's shelter. It's run by some Carmelite Catholic sisters. They're brave, heroic women. They've been there for a long time, and I take my classes there often because I'd rather have them see a sermon than hear a sermon. So we walked in late the other afternoon, and there are about 40 homeless women hunched over their soup and saltines having their dinner. And the law class looked on in amazement, and they said, who are these women? How do they fall through the streets? What happened in their lives? And they suddenly realized these are people outside the law. They also realized exactly what laws represent, the failure of love. That's all laws are, really. So the nun walks over and greets us. And I say, sister, I'd like to help out. I'll tell you what, I'll go around the block. I'll talk to my neighbors. I'll get some food and clothing for you. And I'll bring it down next Saturday morning. I'll fill up my car. I'll bring it down for the homeless women. Sister looks up at me and says, oh, that's wonderful. We love it when you NPR C-SPAN liberals come around with your Volvos filled up with food for us. It touches us oh so deeply. <laughs> the sister had a slightly sarcastic side to herself that occasionally flared as it, <laughs> that occasionally flared as it did then. She said, listen, good friend, if you really want to help out, skip all that fuzzy wuzzy feel good number, which you seem to have a special talent for. She gave me another whack. I think the good nun was in a rather foul mood. It was the beginning of Lent. She was always having lemons for breakfast as penance, <laughs> which, which, which fouled her up for the rest of the day. Only the Catholics got that one. All right. <laughs> she said, if you really want to help out, go talk to that lady in the corner. She pointed to a bedraggled, toothless woman in her mid-sixties, wrinkled skin, strung out hair. She had the agony of the earth in her eyes. I said, you mean just talk to her, that's all? And the nun said, yes, it'd be doing plenty. We have enough food and clothing here, but we don't have enough people to talk to the women because loneliness is the great pain of street life. And many did talk to her, and we talked to the other women. And many students were forever changed by that experience. How do I know? Well, those of you who are teachers know that one of the great joys of teaching, we get to keep up with our students long after they leave us. I always ask the law students, what do you remember about your three or four years getting your JD? And I expect they're gonna tell me about that awesome and momentous day that we all discussed the nuances of the Ninth and 14th Amendments they tend to forget that for some odd reason, but they sure remember the day we went to the women's shelter because they woke them up and shook them up. And as a result, many go into poverty law, which is where we need our lawyers. They go into welfare reform law, which is where we need our lawyers. They go into prison reform law, which is where we need our lawyers, or public interest law. We don't need any more lawyers on K Street or Wall Street. We don't need any more lawyers defending Martha Stewart or Scooter Libby, they're going to do just fine. We need lady-in-the-corner lawyers. But just a little experience like that. I work with one high school every Wednesday, and this is a very elite girls' school in Washington called the Madeira School, a very elite school. 
Every Wednesday, all the girls are released and they go get internships, hospitals, in the jails, they teach literacy. And it does radicalize them because they realize that they're gonna leave high school one or two types of people, either somebody who was self-centered or other-centered. I teach, I'm not your conventional teacher. I don't, and in my high school classes, I give no homework, I give no tests and no exams. I think homework and exams and tests are all forms of academic violence, which my students have no trouble agreeing with that one. <laughs> now, I like this, I like this peacemaking, yes, yes. <laughs> There's two ways to learn. You either learn by fear or you learn by desire. Schools mostly teach by fear. Homework represents fear-based learning. Exams represent fear-based learning. And the kids learn how to play the game. Well, well and, and all of us learn how to play it also. Let me ask you a question. How many of you can, how many think back to your school years, whether you're in school now or out, or out of school? How many of you can raise your hand right now and say with absolute honesty, I have never ever cheated in school? Maybe, and let me hear you say it, just for my edification. <laughs> Very good, all right, three hands go up. All right, next question. How many of you did cheat in schools? All right, a few of you are taking the Fifth Amendment here. I mean, some hands didn't go up on either one of these. <laughs> no self-incrimination tonight. And why do we do it? Did it out of fear. I better get those good grades. There's a wonderful line from a Walker Percy novel, the great writer from Louisiana. He said, you can make all A's and go out and flunk life. I've seen it happen. It also takes a little time to figure it out. I had a student a few years ago at American University. She was a second semester senior. She'd always kind of float into class late. She got from a very wealthy family, I learned later wore beautiful clothes. She always kind of, we had a big class of about 200 people, and she'd always kind of float in, go in the back row. And, and as you may know, when teachers are up lecturing before the students, we always have one great question on our minds. And we always, we always look in their eyes and we always ask ourselves, are they getting it? Ah, yes, we're dispensing the truth and wisdom and they're absorbing it all day. They are definitely getting it. Well, this girl would go in the back row and she had one of those glazed out, foggy looks about her. She's always looking out like that. And she was obviously an English major. <laughs> <laughs> They're always looking in the ozone, having these, remembering some Shakespeare sonnets word by word. <laughs> and I'd look at her, I'd say, my God, she's now within six hemispheres of getting it. Well, she graduated. I didn't hear from her for a few years. And then one day a letter came, a touching and poignant letter. She had joined the Peace Corps. And I said to myself, wow, that's the last one in that class I'd ever thought would have joined the Peace Corps. So they sent this girl to, uh, to Morocco, a small country, northern Africa, near the Sahara. She taught school. She stayed an extra year. She stayed for a third year. And I learned when she left the little village, just a small little tribal town, that the children wept uncontrollably when she left. She taught a little bit in the school, helped the kiddies out. I took them on a field trip one day. They're walking through town. It was kind of rainy out, and just by chance, a, a pickup truck brought in some hay for the camels. And it parked right as the kids were walking by their little rope line, the little kids a little rope line. And it stopped right near the children. And the teacher looked over the side, and, and there were some newspapers that were absorbing the rain and all the muck. But one newspaper was still dry. It was the International Paris Herald Tribune, the international newspaper. It was about three months old, but still fresh news if you haven't heard it. <laughs> she opens it up to the op-ed page, and there by wild chance was a column of mine. And she reads it and writes a letter to me. Dear Professor, you may not remember, may I wasn't one of your bright lights that year, 
I was restless. I couldn't wait to get out of college, to get out here and start doing some things. I joined the Peace Corps. They sent me here. I took your class, and I heard you talking about this nonviolence, and I did a little reading, but I wasn't ready for it. I was distracted. But now that I'm out here doing the works of peace in a small way, it's all come back to me. Yes, nonviolence does make sense. I never forgot that letter because the moral of the story is so obvious that every flower will bloom when it's ready. And some flowers bloom early and some bloom late. And we teachers have no right or need ever to know whether or not you're getting it. Some get it early and some get it late and some may never get it. But our job is to teach with passion and teach with fire. I was riding my bicycle out to school the other morning and there's a father who had a daughter in my class a few years ago and she's now a senior in college. And we stopped the other morning. I said, how's your daughter doing? Well, she's doing very good with her grades. As she studies hard. But I'm very disappointed, he said, because she has no passion for anything. And it, and it greatly disturbed uh, this father. He said, how do I get her excited about something? Some cause or some issue. I think that's the problem. And I think teachers ought to be... Ought, ought to be in charge. There's a wonderful member here of your community who wrote a book a few years ago entitled, What Do You Stand For? And it's a great collection of essays, interviews with some of the world's great peacemakers and activists. And his name is Jim Lickman. You may know Jim, he lives right here. And he's, he's, he is, he is a true activist. And he came to my classes not long ago when he was visiting Washington. And he spoke to the kids. He's a leading thinker and writer about ethics. And he, and he gave a stirring speech to all my classes. And I'd like to honor Jim by asking him to stand up and give us a nice round of applause for Jim Lickman. And he sat, and he wrote this wonderful book, and, and about a week later, I received, he sent, he sent about 50 books for my students, free of charge, and, and, and sent them in two, in two large cartons of books. And I thought free? that, I well, <laughs> they were. And, and, uh, and well, you know, what, uh, you know what Scott Fitzgerald once said about books? He said, if your family and friends won't buy your books, who will? Uh, but the students love those books, Jim, and you're a very generous person to do so. There are currently 40 wars in the con There are currently 40 wars or conflicts in the world right now. There's about 35,000 people dying every month in those wars. And who's dying? It's almost always the poor. That's all wars are, really, the poor killing the poor. The wealthy rarely go to war. Think back to Vietnam. There are 535 members of Congress. How many of those members do you think had a son who saw combat in Vietnam? Only one. That was Clarence Long, a labor Democrat from Baltimore, whose son was killed in Vietnam. How many American soldiers right now are graduates uh, 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 how many soldiers now in Iraq are graduates of Ivy League colleges, do you think? Not very many. They're not recruiting in the Ivy Leagues. When Colin Powell left after five years of being chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he gave a press conference. And a reporter asked, General Powell, what are, some, what are you most proud of in your five years as being the chief? He said, I got... ROTC programs in the 320 high schools. In other words, I militarized the 14 years old. So the peace movement needs to go in the schools also. That's why Gandhi so admired soldiers. He said they're disciplined people. They'll sacrifice for their beliefs. Why don't we sacrifice also? So that's where we need to be in the schools. We have 78,000 elementary schools in this country. 20, 
We have 33,000 high schools and about 3,400 colleges and universities. All of those ought to be teaching the basics of conflict resolution, mediation, and peace studies. Otherwise, we have little chance of turning it around. We're going to keep graduating students. And you know what goes on in our schools. We often process our students as though they're slabs of cheese going to Velveeta High <laughs> on to Mozzarella University in Cheddar Grad School. That was a pretty cheesy metaphor, wasn't it? <laughs> we would never, and I teach just one course at the three high schools where I'm teaching. Would we ever graduate anybody with only one math course in 12 years? Or only one science course in 12 years? But even to get one course, it takes so much. But I urge you to go to the local county, go to local public high schools in this area and ask, where's my tax money going? Are we using it to teach our children how to be peacemakers? They will question Caesar and his wars. There are two types of violence, hot and cold violence. Hot is when you feel it, you see it, it's emotional, it's visual, it's visceral. That was 9-11. That was the Virginia Tech massacre. That was the shooting yesterday in Chicago. And it's interesting about 9-11. About you often hear the expression, oh, that changed the world forever. Why didn't we say that about, why, would, why didn't we say that about Rwanda when 800,000 were killed? Why didn't that change the world forever? Why didn't East Timor, where 250,000 were killed, why didn't that change the world forever? And you know what happened after 9-11. There, there were two reactions. There was shock and there was surprise. We were right to be shocked. That was valid. But why were we surprised? Here we are in the United States in the past 20 years. We have sent soldiers either to kill people or threaten to kill people in Libya, Grenada, Panama, Somalia, Haiti, Afghanistan, Sudan, Iraq, as I mentioned those countries before. So why were we surprised? What if somebody here in Santa Barbara walked around town with a baseball bat and walked up behind people every day and cracked them over the head? And yet people walking all around town with, with skulls are cracked open. And finally, one day someone else gets a bat and swings back. Would you be surprised? I doubt it. But we were surprised. Oh my heavens, why doesn't the world love us? We've just been bombing them all these years. Why don't they love us? Someone swung back. And then we went through what we call the Isis. We were caught off guard by 9-11. We went through, first we started to theorize. Hmm, how did this happen? Who did it? And then we began to agonize. Oh, this, this was awful. And then after you do, after you theorize and agonize, then you demonize. Oh, those evil people did it. They're the problem. And then after you theorize, agonize, and demonize, then you moralize. Let's go kill somebody. That'll bring about justice. Three days after 9-11, there was a prayer service at the National Cathedral on 9-14, on the morning that Barbara Lee voted against the war. And Billy Graham came, the Catholic Cardinal came, the rabbis came, the mullahs came. They sang patriotic songs, and at the end of it, they said the Lord's Prayer about forgiving a trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, someone that did, someone did trespass on 9-11 in a rather emphatic way. Did we forgive them? Are you kidding? Let's go kill somebody. John McCain came out of the church that day, and he was interviewed by a reporter. And McCain said, this is what we always do when we have a crisis in America. First we pray, and then we fight. What he really meant, first we pray, then we kill. 
but we don't like to use those words. We had four options, and I'm going to stop David in about two minutes to take a few questions and answers and disagreements. The, we had four choices about 9-11. We had a military choice, which we particularly chose. Got a problem? Go bomb somebody. The second choice was a political solution. What's a political solution? Bush, Cheney, Wolfowitz could have gone on an airplane and gone to talk to bin Laden and talk to Saddam Hussein. Most people say, oh my God, that is so, so surreal. You can't talk to evil people like that. Well, we heard that same argument in the early 1970s when Richard Nixon was demonizing the godless atheist Chinese communists. I want to take over the world, he said. And what did Nixon finally do? He went to China and he talked, he negotiated, compromised, reconciled, and they sent him home with a bag of ping pong balls and two pandas. <laughs> For all you trivia fans that like to keep up with the important things. <laughs> and China is trading with us and lost money. We're in debt to the Chinese. I wonder how much the communists enjoy the reality. They're going to save the capitalists from their own excesses. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, 1980, Orlando, Florida, gave a speech to the American Legion and called the Union the evil empire. And what did he do the next year? He went to Moscow and spoke to the evil people. And, and they sent him home with a box of vodka, which he shared with, who was it, B.B. Rebozo, I think? B.B. loved vodka. That's another little trivia fact. And now they're trading with us. You go talk to people. And compared to the Soviet Union and China, Bin Laden is a mosquito. You go talk to people. And then you see how you can deal. That's rational. But to go kill women and children, as we're doing in Iraq, I had a student in my high school class who was born in Iraq in 1986. She was born in the Abu Ghraib prison. We've all heard about that. Her mother was a political prisoner. Her father was locked up also. They took the baby out of the prison they took her home, her friends came for the baby, took them home to the grandparents who lived in Najaf, a town you've heard about, about an hour south of Baghdad. February 1991, the American pilots came and bombed Najaf. This family lost everything. They had to flee because they, uh, they, they were political dissidents, hated by, hated by the uh, uh, Saddam Hussein government. They had to flee to Saudi Arabia they had to walk on the highway of death. They couldn't march by day because it was 120 degrees heat. They had to march by night, and they were shot at by the Republican Guard. They were given bounties to kill the dissidents. The child lived in the refugee camp for six or seven years, very little water, no schooling, no doctors, and then came back in 91 to Najaf, and then the Americans uh, came to bomb her family. She came, and the family was finally released from, from the refugee camp. They made their way to Cairo on a flatbed truck. They made their way to London and came to Washington, where I ended up with this girl in my high school class at that poor school near the White House. She said, two governments tried to kill me, the American government and the Iraqi government. I have little use for either. I used to bring her around the schools to give lectures to the private schools and also the public schools. Children would weep at her story. I said, what are you going to do? She's a senior now at American University. I said, what are you going to do with your life? I'm going to become a doctor. She's a pre-med student now. I said, where are you going to go? I'm going to go work in the refugee camps. That child knows something about life and also death. The, th uh, the third solution was a legal solution. It's called due process. That's what Milosevic got. That's what Noriega got. Uh, obey international law. Uh, uh, obey the Nuremberg provisions and also the Geneva Conventions. That's due process. 
And the last solution is a, a moral one. Yes, I do think we should have forgiven uh, the people who did 9-11 and ask them uh, uh, to please forgive us of all our far greater systematic violence. 9-11 was a one-day crime spree, far, far different from the well-organized military campaigns as well as, as keeping our nuclear weapons at the ready every day. We have submarines prowling the world with nuclear arms, all ready to go. And that's why I admire your work, David, so much, and also those who work with you. I, I hope that we can get this. I, I think we're reaching a peak now where the movement is gaining strength, and you're hearing more and more about it. And I do honor the program that you have worked so hard all these years. So those are the four solutions. I think we have to work to do this in our schools. I just want to finish up on one little story, and then we'll take a few questions and answers. I do a little experiment with my classes. I ask them the first day of every semester, I ask them in a very earnest voice. You always got to be earnest the first day of school. You have to be almost unctuous, because it's such a thrilling experience to be in our learning truth and wisdom. I want you to do a little experiment. I say, please get up out of your chairs and go stand in front of the high school and stand there for, stand there for 10 minutes and count as best you can all the red cars you see go by and all the green cars you see go by. Everybody got instructions now? Pay attention. Red cars, green cars for 10 minutes. And come back in. I'll have two questions for you. So they all dutifully jump up, and I, I look out the window, and they're, they're, they're all counting cars whizzing by. They come back in the classroom uh, over here. Well, I got 10 red, 5 green. What'd you get? Yeah, I got 5 green, 10 red, about the same. Question number one. Didn't anybody think that was kind of stupid <laughs> to be out there counting red cars and green cars? And usually the class intellectual is always one. Yes, I did think that was kind of dumb. Well, my second question is, if you thought it was kind of stupid and dumb, why'd you do it then? <laughs> and they get right away what it's about, a little exercise in questioning abusive power. Because power keeps asking us to do dumb things. You put your faith in nuclear bombs that'll keep us safe. Put your faith in, in the military contractors. They'll keep us safe. Now place your faith in the gun and the bomb, and we keep on counting the cars. Uh, just two last thoughts. You've been a terrific audience, and, and I do welcome you to come to Washington. I know Jim Lickman spoke in our class a few, uh, a few weeks ago. And if you do care about being peacemakers, it's one thing to go out and change the world, which is fine, but make sure the world never changes you. And if you do care about either beginning or expanding your commitment uh, to nonviolence and becoming people who are other-centered, not self-centered. If you do care about that, either beginning or expanding your commitment uh, to peace and justice in a small way or a large way, the only word that really matters is a simple, sacred, one-syllable word, start. Start. I thank you very much, and I'll see you again.